Good evening, everyone. My name is Lebocha Madise, Azure Go-To-Market Manager based out of South Africa. And welcome to the Let's Learn.net Africa series. Today, I have with me Homolema Mohabi, as well as Matthew Lebowitz. Uh, James, please introduce yourselves. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, my name is Homolema Mohabi, or Homo for short. I'm a cloud advocate on the Power Platform team. Um, focusing on Power Apps and Fusion development, Fusion also including .NET, which is why I'm here with you today. And I'm with my co uh, colleague, Matthew. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew. I am a, um, a software engineer on the .NET Maui team. We do all things mobile and desktop nowadays, and uh, just basically bringing C Sharp and .NET to more platforms rather than just server websites and console apps and let's bring it mobile so yeah thank you matt and thank you homo so if you're tuning in today we're going to learn about the basics of cloud computing and both homo Lemo and matthew will be taking that through us and also teaching us how to build an asp.net core web app and deploying it to azure so without any further ado uh, let's kick off. Sure. So let's get so our slides shared and then we can get going. Um, yeah. So as we have said, we have introduced uh, ourselves. I am Homo. I'm with Matthew and Lebo Khang will be helping us in the background. We have a lot to cover today. This is a let's learn.net session. However, you wanted to take some time to talk about Azure and cloud computing in general. We're going to be introducing you to cloud com computing by covering basic cloud con uh, concepts, deployment models, and understanding shared responsibility in the cloud. We'll also be talking about the consumption-based model, which is what Azure is heavily based on. We we'll also have a couple of knowledge checks along the way to reinforce what we are what we are learning. So uh, please just follow along with us, and we hope you do have fun. So with that, let's get started off with the first module. Um, this is really intro level into cloud and cloud computing in general. And if you if you are familiar with the cloud in any way. This will largely be a review for you, but hopefully you can share some of your insights in chat as well. So we're going to start off with a um, video and then take it from there. What is cloud computing? What is cloud computing? Just like when you shop for your own computer, cloud computing lets you choose the power and features you need to run your software. The difference is, with cloud computing, the PC is in a cloud provider's data center instead of physically with you. This lets you pay for only the services you use. Plus, someone else gets to manage the upkeep of the computer. Each cloud provider will have their own selection of services to choose from, but the basic services provided by all cloud providers are compute power and storage. Compute power is how much processing your computer can do. For example, when buying a home computer, you may choose a computer with eight gigabytes of RAM and the latest processor to run the software you need today. But as the load on the computer grows, you find that it slows down. With cloud computing, you can add and remove compute power as you need it. This saves on costs, since you only pay for the resources you use. Storage is the volume of data you can store on your computer. A traditional computer has limited hard drive space. Over time, you may have to run out and buy another hard drive to store more data. With cloud computing, you can request more storage as you need it. Cloud providers manage the upkeep of the computer, so you don't have to. They will make sure that there are backups, that the operating system is up to date, as well as making sure that everything is up and running 24 hours a day. So as your business grows and your computing needs change, 
you can quickly bring on new computing resources in a cost-effective way. Now, that was a very cool video, which at a high level explains the basics of cloud computing. So to reiterate, the provisioning of computing services through the internet is referred to as the, as the um, cloud. These, these services comprise of typical IT infrastructure, such as networking, uh, VMs, databases, and even storage. And in addition to those services, cloud extends beyond the traditional IT offerings to include machine learning, AI, and even Internet of Things, or IoT. But unlike traditional data centers, cloud computing is not limited by the physical infrastructure that it actually uses. It's more based on um, the way in which the Internet can provide those services to customers every day. So this implies that if you need to quickly scale up on your IT infrastructure, you can avoid the wait for constructing a new data center and instead utilize the cloud to rapidly expand your IT skills. But now we're going to be talking about the shared responsibility model. Uh, Matthew, do you want to take this one? Yes, I can, I can take this one. Um, yeah, so I suppose one way to look at the shared responsibility is to, to maybe look at sort of a traditional way and then the other end of the spectrum and then see how they all fit together. Like in a traditional um, server environment, you would have, let's say, a company, it has a server and this would be storage, it would be networking, it would be you know, authentication and the applications that are running for the internal business and maybe a website for the for the for the customers and that would all be you know in an office somewhere on a server they probably spent loads of cash on it just to buy all the fancy hardware and you know that's expensive to maintain so you've got the computer there that obviously needs to get updated someone's going to make sure windows is updated someone's going to make sure you know the, the the software that is using is updated the website is you know up to date with with uh, things, let's say you're hosting on, I don't know, let's, let's just go, if you're going PHP, you know, WordPress, I don't know, you can host your company blog on WordPress, but someone's got to update that and then the operating system and all that sort of stuff. And that that is sort of the, the far column on the right. That That's where you do everything. You know, you, you host information, the data, you host the user identity, for example, people to log in and edit the blog. You know, you host the applications, let's say you're a purchasing company, Someone's going to host the, the sales software, and that's all on your side, the, the dark blue on the on the right. And and that's expensive because you have to pay the hardware, you pay the software, you've got to pay the maintenance. And, you know, and let's just say you, the company is going slow, you know, and the spikes up during peak times. You, you've got to buy the biggest server you can afford to, to do it all. You know, because you can't say, oh, well, the server's not big enough to handle the, the Black Friday sales or the Cyber Mondays. You know, that, that's that's not really uh, good for business. And that's where, you know, where you like, okay, what is the cloud option? There's, there's multiple levels to the cloud option, and you basically pick how much responsibility and power you have. So for the sort of, okay, I don't want to host the hard drive, the physical, disks you can say okay i would like to use infrastructure as a service this would be you host uh, microsoft or any cloud provider but in this case azure would host hard drives in the cloud it would host effectively imagine the network cables and the network hardware as well as you know any infrastructure the physical metal and, and silicon they will host that now be the infrastructure as a service so basically you would get this endpoint whether it be like a you know, some sort of service and you would stick your VM on there. And and that's sort of one thing. You have absolute power, but you have less to worry about now with the, the physical hardware, no longer your responsibility. But if you are a company that says, well, I don't really care about more things. For example, I don't care about what version of Windows I'm on. I always want the latest. I don't need fancy network things. I don't need certain applications. I just want to use those ones. And that's where you can go to more platform as a service. You have less responsibility and, uh, you know, you can just do what you need to focus on. 
And then the sort of the even more what we're even going to be doing now today with the, the app set is like, well, I don't care about anything at all. All I want to do is I want to write this website and write this app and I want to stick it in the cloud. All I care about is the content on my website and I want people to, to be able to log in, right? You control the passwords and the usernames and stuff, but then Microsoft takes care of the rest. And that's where sort of the software as a service, this would be like, for example, um, like let's say you're making an Excel, right? You've got a spreadsheet application. You don't care about anything. All you want to do is write the software and have users use it. So that's where we the software as a service. And that's basically from going from you own everything and you must maintain everything to you own just your code, which is obviously a thing. And if you need anything in between, you can pick uh, different technologies in the cloud, uh, all different variations on Azure of what you want. And some of those blocks have like, you know, shared responsibility. So you can even have options to say your identity, or you, or you can use Active Directory, right? Then you don't have to worry about anything, but maybe you want to do a self-hosted identity, well, then you can take on that ownership. So not only do you have flexibility between uh, like sort of oh, infrastructure and software as a service, you actually have flexibility within software as a service. So yeah, it, it's shared responsibility. You and Microsoft take responsibility of various things, but there's many levels, so you can actually pick what you want to take responsible for, take responsibility for. Yeah, so. Yeah, no, sure. And um, that is uh, very true. And it, even if we take that model and go a step higher, that's when we come to speak about the various cloud models that we have. And, that, um, and what you are responsible for, as opposed to what the actual cloud provider is, is, um, should be handling as well. So when it comes to these cloud models, they really define the deployment type of the cloud resources. And with those models, there are three main types. And the ones that we're gonna be speaking about are private, public, as well as the hybrid cloud. When it comes to private cloud, it is still the cloud, how, but it's, it's more of it is your cloud and it's your cloud only. But how can you have cloud if it's just if it's just yours? In this case, you're the only entity that's provisioning resources on that particular cloud, which gives you much greater control over the infrastructure of your company, for example. So it's basically the way that it works. It's a data center that's set up either on your own site or by a third party that is dedicated for your company only. So you're the only one who's creating resources. You're the only one who have who has active deployments on that specific cloud. And because of which, this is obviously the much more costly option, but many companies even now still prefer to use this model over the others, just so that they have that greater form of control. The second type of cloud is the public cloud, which is the complete opposite of what private cloud is. Public cloud is entirely built and maintained by a third party, but it has it gives access to everyone. So Azure is a typical example of a public cloud because anyone can go into Azure and provision resources and deploy their own apps and um, services, and you sort of share that that um, field with other companies as well, you know, millions and millions of other um, users. The only thing with the public cloud is the GA or the general availability is the one key difference here because as opposed to the private cloud, which is always available to you and you only, the public cloud, that might not always be the actual case. So, but in terms of cost, this is also the cheaper version. And then we have the third type of cloud, and this is uh, the hybrid cloud because this refers to a computing setup that integrates both private and public clouds. Now, if you're on a cloud, why would you want to choose both, or why would you, or why would you want to have you know two types of cloud um, services running on your um, on your um, company? And the reason for that is, is that this kind of arrangement can enable um, the private cloud 
to rapidly increase its capacity to host your um, services if demands rise. So you so you can have a, a private cloud that only works for you, but if there's a sudden spike in demand from your users, from your customers, then it can quickly provision those resources on a public cloud. Furthermore, with the hybrid cloud system, uh, tech can also provide a added layer of security, especially if it's using a well-known and trusted uh, public cloud. For uh, for instance, uh, users will also have the flexible nature to decide which services to retain in the public cloud and which services to retain in their private cloud. So it's really up to you where each of those will live. I really love the fact that we get options when it comes to the types of clouds that we can um, use. Um, but let's also discuss the key differences between the three types of clouds. Yeah, I can I can sort of go with that. So, like the table shows some of the key things, and, and you mentioned them, Homo, the, um, the the sort of the differences between private and the public cloud, and then the, sort of the hybrid is almost the best of both worlds, which gives you the most flexibility. You know, and I think the difference, as you mentioned, was the cost. Um, obviously, it all depends on what you're doing. But the private cloud, you, as I mentioned before, you have to buy everything. You, you have to do everything or you have to pay someone to do it all for you. Whereas the public cloud, you're leveraging, you know, another customer that's using different things. So Microsoft buys lots of hard drives, you know, and you use some, they use some, and Microsoft mm -hmm. buys a lot. So you don't have to go out and source your set and then you have to upgrade it everyone benefits from public cloud and things like applications, as you mentioned, you want to store them locally, but you might want to scale up to the public cloud and that's great. So you can, you can choose that, but you can also choose like, hey, where do you want your data stored? And this is where the hybrid cloud really shines. You can have a server local, but all your, your, your public facing technology is mm -hmm. out there on the public cloud, but the, the private cloud hosts the data or you can do it the opposite way around, as you said, for security, compliance, or legal reasons. You can say, well, the application runs locally, but I have this, as you said, the layer of security or the compliance levels uh, that's running in the public cloud so that you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, am I compliant? Well, you are because Azure is compliant and you're using Azure for your, your authentication or your user data, and you don't have to worry about that. So it's, Again, it's more the choice of what do you want to be responsible for and, you know, how much are you willing to take on the maintenance and how much are you willing to spend? And also what is important to you is, is having data in your own server, like a government probably doesn't want, the CIA doesn't want to have the data hosted on, you know, uh, Ado, uh, uh, Azure, but who knows maybe they do and the same thing is you don't want to be like a company with everything hosted locally I mean, all your customers are global so i'm connecting from indonesia and i'm going to buy a product from amazon and i have to like connect via america you know just to buy i don't know toothbrushes whereas if it's a public cloud global distribution and all that so it, it's again just it's a choices and that's the and that's the problem there's too many choices so you know what do you want to do is it is an option available for you so yeah yeah and just like the um hybrid cloud and in anything really when it comes to creating so solutions at scale there will always be an intersection of different methods tools um services that we use to accomplish that set goal and that's no difference when it comes to our cloud models like we spoke about three main cloud uh, models, but one use case that is becoming increasingly popular is the multi-cloud model, where you end up using multiple cloud providers to accomplish different uh, tasks, right? So this is possible either through the fact that you like a feature from Azure, but you also would like to use features from AWS or um, GCP, and you want to use all of them in the same in, in environment. So it's also likely that you could be in the process of migrating certain services from one provider to the next. And in that 
like in that period where you're migrating things slowly, you're using two clouds, right? So if you want to move from from um, from a GCP to a um, Azure, you're not going to simply just take everything at once. You're going to slowly bring in resources from one to the next. And of course, in that uh, transition period, you're using a multi-cloud model. So it's either you want to use multi-cloud on on purpose where you specifically say these services will be on, on one and these other services will be on another, or it could be un, in a intentional where you are trying to transition your um, resources. And in that transition period, you're using a multi-cloud model. So it's really up to um, you and of course, up to the, the um, scenario or uh, that you want to um, have in your business. And a tool that I personally love is um, Azure Arc, which is a set of tools that help enable you to manage your cloud in an environment. And the thing with that is, is that even if you're, you are using the multi-cloud model, you can use Azure Arc to manage these various tools wherever your, your um, resources lie. So if you're using a public cloud that is solely based inside of um, Azure or a private cloud that's inside your personal data center or a, high, or, or a hybrid type of setup, Azure Arc is one of the best tools that you can use to manage that, um, that complex in, um, environment. So with these talks of you know, the various cloud models that we have, not just in Azure, but in, you know, in cloud computing in um, general, it's no secret that the cloud costs money. So how can we manage costs inside of a cloud environment? Yeah, I think the, before you talk about managing costs, there's sort of the, maybe two key points that, you know, key points, two key sides of the story uh, of, of how costing works. So we could take a private cloud or an on-premise server, and this would be someone goes to the shop or and buys the, the, the physical hardware. They set it up and it costs, you know, let's say half a million dollars for that, for a big server, right? You want to do some amazing stuff. I don't know how much tech costs these days. And you run that, and two years later, you have to buy more, right? You, you either got more users, uh, you need faster, you need newer, maybe there's new AI chips coming out, more money needs to be spent. And, you know, that is expensive. And if you're the only user, you often, as I mentioned, right at the top was like, if you've got a spike, right, you have to buy the bigger server. Because if you get a million users one day, but regular is like 100 people, You've got, to, you've got to support the million users and you know that is expensive to pay for what you're not using for 90 percent of the time and then there is the cloud model which is like you know what you pay for nothing except what you use so that's where the difference comes it's local server you pay right up front the big bucks and then you use what you have and you need more, you spend more money and you pay more for maintenance. Whereas the cloud consumption is like, well, Microsoft will pay for everything and you pay to use the CPU. So if you have a spike of a billion users on, on, on Cyber Monday, right? Everyone's purchasing, I don't know, the AI pen, right? You don't have to worry. The slider will be dragged right to the end. It's gonna cost you, I don't know, a million bucks to do that on the one day and you drop it all the way down at the end uh, after Cyber Monday's pass and you're paying, I don't know, whatever your, your typical costs are. And that's mm -hmm. like the flexibility because you're only paying for what you want. And the same thing is is, is that, um, uh, yeah. yeah, so it, it, it's more, again, it's a choice of what, what are you uh, focusing on. And, and a consumption-based model allows you to be more flexible in what you're paying and then you know, as you mentioned with the, the managers, you know, Azure has a, a whole dashboard dedicated to, you know, how to manage your costs, with predictions about what, what, what are the future costs projected to be, you know, and you can also, as I mentioned, the scaling, you can, you can toggle values and sliders to optimize what you have and pay just for what you use. So you could obviously have a runaway server and, you know, 
someone's, I don't know, used too much CPU or a background service is consuming all the resources. And that's where the management, the cost management portal will come in and be like, well, you can set up alerts, whether it be email integrations to, to whatever technology that you, you have that like, whoa, we've predict, picked up an anomaly or you, someone's spending uh, too much money, you know, on Azure, you get those notifications, you can go in and fix it. Yeah. So these, it's not just like, what what oh as your office cost benefits but it's also cost management benefits as well by having a, a dashboard to see what it is and see real time what is actually going on with your your resources and how much it's costing you and then it will also allow you to to make predictions oh i've got a i'm using x amount of of services and i predict or management predicts you know a 10 times increase for a cyber monday so we can take the normal costs and, and see real time how much it would cost and prepare whatever it needs to be, or maybe say, hey, we need to stay up beforehand and do some processing before or whatever. And that's that's the beauty of the consumption based. You pay for what you use and you have more flexibility. And you don't have to pay someone to manage, you know, a physical person on site to manage, oh, is the server, what happens if the power goes out? You know, do you have, you know, at least in Africa, uh, South Africa, especially with all the power things is like do you have enough UPS power to last those 12 plus hours of, of, of no electricity? You know, yeah. so so that's one thing. And you know, Microsoft probably has a private power station next door, uh, just fueling that. So yeah, it's great, great flexibility and lots of choices. Yeah, no, as you uh, mentioned, one of the, the key tools of using Azure is that cost monitor to track and to set like any, um, like, uh, reminder or an alert to avoid any unintended costs but there's also a lot of cost effective ways to get started um is for example if you're a um, student there's the azure for um students benefit that allows you to get you know up to a hundred dollars of of um azure uh services as well as 12 months free of additional free um services or if you're not a um student you can sign up for uh, uh, Azure with a credit card and get that two hundred dollars worth of Azure services plus the additional twelve months of um, free services. So, getting started with um, Azure, it's not as expensive as one as one might think. But obviously, as you use more um, services and as you deploy more more apps, then it is very very crucial that you do indeed track those um costs. So again, yeah, I think we we um spoke about the various pricing models that we have um, when using the um cloud. You are essentially renting the um service in a pay as you go type model. So um, if you ever get to a point where maybe there's a huge un unintended cost, you know maybe you're actually using Azure to its full advantage because you're using the um. Uh, resources that that drag those um costs up, but it is very very crucial that you get into the habit of setting those um those uh those reminders and making sure that you're monitoring whatever you are using. So I think we've spoken quite enough, um, and it's time for a for a very quick knowledge check. Um, what do you think? Yeah, let's do it. I'm sure. I'm sure, we can answer some questions. Um, yeah, let's see if uh, people ha have been focusing. <laughs> uh, please feel suppose, free to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was, I was going to say exactly what you were going to say. So go ahead. Yeah, no. Please feel free to answer in chat as well. Um, we are we are seeing all the um comments as they come in, and let's get questions going as well. We, we do have a Q and A session, um, where we can. Uh, answer a few of your questions as well. So the first question that we have here is what is cloud computing? And that is the basics, the basis of why we are here. We spoke about it at the very beginning. Um, we have four options. We have A, which is the delivery of computing services over the internet. You know, that seems like a like a roundabout way of describing what the um, cloud is. 
that makes sense. Um, B, the delivery of storage services over the internet. Uh, I don't know, this sounds like a subset of um, A in a way where it is still part of computing services, but it's just another type of um, service that the cloud provides to you. And then C is the delivery of websites accessible via the internet. Or we have D, which is all of the above. What are we taking? Yeah. No, I think I think you, you mentioned at the beginning that it's a subset. Storage services is a subset of computing services and websites is a is a sort of a hosting service, which is a subset. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if uh, anyone has some strong opinions of which is the correct option. <laughs> sure. I'm I'm seeing a lot of A, which is actually the the um correct choice, but we, but we wanted to be more in inclusive of all the um answers here where it is computing services as a whole, but those computing services includes the rest of the um, services as well, like storage, like websites, and so and so forth. So in this instance, the answer is D. But but of course, if you answered A, we're not going to crucify you at all. So no worries there. A was correct, uh, but also B. Being a subset yeah. <laughs> of A, B for A and B. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Sorry. Do you want to take this next one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, sort of the the next next one is uh, which which cloud model uses some data centers focused on providing cloud service to anyone that wants them, and some data centers that are focused on a single customer. So, it's a uh, think of a, the model. Which model has the one that has you know a public like giving it all away, like a, a service that's for <laughs> everyone in the public, as well as, you know, just for a particular customer. So, I mean, I suppose we spoke about it just a few moments ago. So the public mm -hmm. cloud is, is for everyone. Anyone, as you mentioned, could spin up a, a website. The, the, the hybrid cloud is someone that has a, maybe a website in the public, but the database is private. And then of course, uh, with Azure Arc or, you know, not using any infrastructure is the multi-cloud. Um, that would be like, oh, you have the database on Azure, you have a website on AWS, and using Google Cloud for, I don't know, authentication. I don't know why you would want that. So that would be multi-cloud, <laughs> multiple companies. So Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, no, the, the um, clue in this one is really the um, fact that one of the options is focused on a single um, single user or a single um, company. So you can't really say public cloud. So it's really a mixture of um, both. It doesn't mention other cloud providers. So I think the answer there is B, hybrid cloud, because you're using two types of um, clouds there's no mention of external providers. So the answer there would be B. I think that is good. And we have one more check here. Let's see what this one says. This one is according to the shared responsibility model, which cloud service type places the most responsibility on the customer? Um, this is, this was, uh, explained very earlier on when we spoke about the shared responsibility model. Um, maybe if we can like start off from the bottom where, you know, platform as a um, service, you know, the there's not much for us to really um, configure. There's a, they, they, there is a bit, but in a sense, in, in, this, in this specific question, we don't have to do much. So a platform as a service could be maybe uh, the Azure app service. Later on, when we create our .NET app and we publish it to, to Azure, all we need is a platform or a place to post or to deploy a certain service. And um, the provider provides that, um, that uh, platform for us to do just that. Um, there's not much middleware that we have to go and personally configure ourselves. So platform as a service there in that instance is out. Then we also have software as a um, service, you know, a uh, very typical example of this is M365. 
we have M365 that has a whole host of tools, um, apps for productivity, calendar, a bunch of different things that are provided to us as a M service. We don't really care where they are hosted. We don't care how they get to us. We just pay a standard fee every month and we get that service um, constantly. So that is a typical example of a, a software as a M service. The, the load on us as the customer is very, very minimal. And then of course that leaves A, which is infrastructure as a M service, which in this case is the correct answer. And the reason for that is, is that it just, it places the most responsibility on us, the customer, with the cloud provider just being responsible for the basics of the physical security, the power, and the network. So with that, uh, we'll go into our next section. Uh, I think Matt will uh, take us in. Yes. Okay. So... Um, as we mentioned uh, all the way before, all, all the different repeatedly, like different benefits and stuff. So now we're going to start dialing into some of those benefits and we're going to talk about, um, you know, I don't know how we can switch to the next slide with some some cool things for people to follow along. Is is the, you know, the benefit of, of availability and scalability. And then, you know, that's that's how much you are using and how, how available it is to customers, but then there's also the reliability and predictability. This is basically keeping that application running, uh, keeping that application uh, working smoothly. And then of course we go on talk a little bit about um, security and governance. This would be like security from you know <clears throat> an attack from an outsider or security for your your your, um, your customer data, as well as the governance, which would be like oh the GDPR, I think it's the one, or or some sort of medical HIPAA acts, uh, you know, all, all those those sort of things. Like, how do you make sure that you meet the compliance requirements set out by local and international, or you know, national government, uh, or just general regulators? And then we're going to talk about how it's also uh, very easy, and the power you have in order to manage. Uh, things in the cloud, as opposed to, you know, you need something, let's go to the shop and buy it. Yeah, so I think. Yeah, you and, want to and, maybe and, just cover, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and on the first one, we can talk about sort of, as I mentioned, well, the availability and scalability, and we can see sort of what, is, what does that mean? So we can break it down into, into each one of those and how they relate. So availability is basically you saying, I have an application, it's, um, it's running, it's great, and I want to make sure that that uh, application is available to, to multiple people around the world, available all the time, and, you know, it doesn't, you know, basically you want that application 100% of the time to be available to customers anywhere and and however they choose to to access it obviously you know how, how they win and, and how they access it. so when, when you're building an application you know the, this is important right you need your customers to access it but then the other question we always mention about those spikes is the scalability is you know there's two types of scalabilities really there's the one like I have a customer, the company's been well, and we have doubled our customer base, right? You want to be able to make your website work smoothly with one customer and smoothly with 100 customers. But there's also the other scalability that is, is often the most important where people will be like more tolerant of issues when they're just accessing it, you know, oh, it's a bit slow today, well, that's okay. You know, it's generally okay versus that, yeah, it's critical for business to be there. It's a spike. It's a Cyber Monday. That thing must scale. There's going to be a hundred thousand customers tuning in right this second to buy, you know, those ten last remaining AI pens. And you don't want your site to go down. If your site goes down, you lose all hundred thousand customers. You know, trying to buy that product or use that service because they're going to associate, you know, the failure. It, it was important to me, and I think about the. Um, uh, you don't need to mention company names, but certain uh, local uh, companies, they struggled a bit with the Cyber Mondays and everyone was angry, you know, 
they offered a discount and it wasn't like they they whatever it was critical for their life maybe it was but they still felt angry because they were waiting they had plans they had the emotional uh, investment in in making a purchase and then the website went down it was a very short time but it was still that that thing and and you don't want that to be associated with your company right so that's why scalability and availability is actually quite a uh, quite an uh, important part of of an application so the cloud offers that and you don't have to worry about on premise there's no way uh, what are you going to do? Cyber Monday comes, you send all your employees out to buy all the desktops they can find at their local shops and bring it in for the one day. And that, that's not a feasible thing. So the cloud just basically makes that a, a slider and that is just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, um, there was someone who says that back in the um, 90s, obviously, I'm not young enough to remember that time. All of these things that we're talking about, you actually had to go and do it manually. And that took skill. And that would fill up, you know, two or three pages of your um, resume. But now all of that skill is just like you said, it's in one simple slider or you just click on uh, like a like a simple drop down and all of that is done for you. So it's it's just it's amazing how far we've come when it comes to the um, cloud. And speaking of that, uh, especially scaling, there's two different types of, um, of um, scaling that we can talk about. The first being vertical uh, scaling. So with this one, if you were developing an app and you needed more processing power, you would scale up to add more CPUs or RAMs to your VM. So this is additionally, like I use my hands quite a bit to explain this one. When you're scaling up, you're adding additional resources on the initial resource that you have. So the, in this case, it's a VM. So you're adding more CPUs, you're adding more RAM. But with vertical scaling, you have the foresight of knowing that you will need um, additional um, resources to develop your app. So with this one, you can see that, okay, I'm... I'm about to reach my um, limits, so let me go ahead and add more. And in the same breath, if you feel like you're not using as many resources as you, as you thought you would need, you can just remove some of those and scale down. That's how I uh, typically remember that uh, process. And then we have horizontal scaling, and this is where instead of adding more, um, more RAM or more CPU, you just add more VMs. And this is because, you know, at any point you can have a very steep spike in, um, in, um, in uh, usage, in data, and you, and you might not always have the foresight to see that coming. So the ability to set those, um, those um, labels so that you are able to add additional VMs um, if need be, is very crucial to the success of any cloud-based app. Um, and then in the same breath, if you, if, you are, if you are noticing or if the cloud provider is noticing that you aren't using as many resources a, as you initially put in, then you have that ability to um, scale the, uh, the other way. So the main key point is the way in which you scale with Vertical scaling, you're adding more VMs, more, I'm sorry, more CPUs, more RAM to your VM. And then with the horizontal scaling, you're just adding additional VMs. And another key difference is that with vertical scaling, you sort of reach AM limits. There's only so much of RAM or so much of CPU that a VM can take, even though that limit is very high. But then when it comes to um, horizontal scaling, you, you, you can add as many as you want for years and years and years. And as long as you're paying for it, that doesn't really run out. Oh, Matthew, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I'm muted. There because you go. I'm breathing. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and, and you mentioned about the the scale. We were talking about scalability. It's like, oh, we would like to to move up or move out, uh, move up or 
out. And yeah. the one of the reasons we want that, we want our, our, our app, let's say we've got application, we've got millions of users joining because we're really popular. Let's take Facebook and, or, or, or any social media, right? There's millions of concurrent users and, you know, you need to scale to support that. But also there's that other thing, right? As I mentioned, you don't want the site to go down, right? There's no use having an amazingly performant website, you know, or, or service. And then it's like, well, it goes down every now and again due to a particular reason, whether it be, you know, a bug, whether it be, you know, infrastructure, the, the, the undersea cable mm -hmm. got chopped and Europe is cut off. Or it could be, I don't know, anything, you know, hardware in the data center corrupting something, you know, I don't know. Something can happen, right? We, we developers, we know about the, the horrors. Yeah. And 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 that's that's where re reliability comes in. It, it's more the the ability for that website, no matter how big, how powerful, how available, how many millions of users doing how many millions of tasks, can it recover from a failure? You don't want the entire website going down. You know, is the the, the recovery isolated? To let's say you've got a, an application that's using multiple services and something goes wrong in one part of your application, you still want the website to to go uh, to be running, right? You, you don't know what the whole plain website to go down when uh, a sales uh, the bank fails to connect and you can't make a purchase, right? It's no use having the whole thing go down, or a massive earthquake comes and shakes the data center up and the whole thing is is hopefully never happens. Uh, goes to rubble and now all of your customers are are sitting there without the ability to and might be a hospital right and that's where this is sort of this reliability of of various things whether it be you know resilient uh parts in the data center let's say the network goes down for whatever reason in, a, in an area it can switch over to to new to new resources and stuff so you don't have to worry about moving the, the connections and moving the the, the the users, but also is that in case of a data center or a catastrophic failure of something, you know, if you have a, a distributed across regions, you know, let's say you have something in the US, uh, the UK, and I don't know, let's pick Australia, and I don't know, Australia has a, a massive earthquake and all the kangaroos go for the data center. You know, the customers will immediately get the connection to the UK and the US. It's not the best performance for the Australian and New Zealand customers, but that's okay. They still have access to potentially life-saving information or, or whatever your, your company is working on. And, and that's one of the really cool things about having a cloud. If you have a single data center in your office and there is, I don't know, a water drop from the ceiling AC on the enterprise, the server, everything's gone, right? Having the cloud, you know, you, you've got so many levels of backup, whether it be, you know, oh, the Windows has crashed, who knows why? It can recover, right? Switch to a new VM. If the network goes down, well, you have another area in the data center, another, uh, I forget what they call it. And then if an entire region goes out due to a national disaster, there mm -hmm. are another region in another continent. So. That is really amazing, but also the opposite of not the opposite or the, the counter to that is, or the, the other side of that is predictability, right? You can uh, pre predict when um, things are going to go wrong, whether it be cost or you know, you, you can see what's happening and you can work out what's going to happen in the future, and you can say, okay, I'm going to need more things. I can predict that, whether uh, uh, we know, obviously, Cyber Monday, we can predict that millions of users are going to connect to try and buy something so you can plan ahead and you can you can uh, deliver a, an experience that is like in the case of the customer mentioned the whole site would go down because you couldn't handle the load because you can predict that you can enable features to allow scaling right this is when the customers are using more and and they require more processing power but also the the cost as i mentioned was you know it's going to cost more and you can maybe do some optimizations in your uh, in your application to say hey can we find a way to use less resources and and things like that so you know, reliability and, and and predictability are, are essential as well to to having a, a cloud app yeah, that will be a a really awesome sight seeing a bunch of kangaroos just 
Russians were data sets. <laughs> yeah, so but like with that, um, you know, that is just as um, crucial as what we're going to be um, speaking about. You know, some people might even find this to be even more important when choosing what cloud provider to go for. So the support for governance and um, compliance, whether you are deploying software as a um, service or, or um, IaaS, there are set templates that can aid in making sure that all is, is, all is deployed in a reasonable manner, in a way that is safe and that you know, follows all the policies and protocol of these various bodies that govern our um, data. And in addition to that, you can easily update all your um, resources to a new standard if it is required. You know, we just had um, a, a, a thing happen a few years ago where a bunch of policies were changed and people were, were forced to think about how they store personal data. And with the cloud, it's very easy to make changes to that data if needs be. And of course, if policy requires you to make all of those um, changes. Regarding security, you can select a cloud platform that meets your specific needs. Um, this is both when we're talking about your actual data. So, you know, uh, protecting it from DDoS, um, you know, firings from people who want to try and access data or physical threats. You know, I've never been to a data center, but I'm pretty sure if I were to walk in, I wouldn't get very far. So both physical and online threats are taken very seriously when it comes to your um, data that is sitting in the um, cloud. Also, just to, as a note, by establishing a strong governance framework, both for your data that sits in the cloud and within your own company that handles this data, which is more than likely coming in from external users, you can keep your cloud footprints up to date and it needs to be in a secure and it needs to be effectively managed. And when we say effectively managed, that's what we will be talking about now in the next section. Yeah, and this is sort of what we've been saying over and over, really. You know, the, the things like scaling, right? You can either have it automatically manage itself and scale up, or you can drag mm -hmm. some sliders. But we're talking about, oh, we want to scale things and manage the scale. Well, cloud providers are super easy. There are sliders, there are text boxes to type in numbers, as opposed to purchasing hardware, you know, and and uh, like, like, te like the next one is like template-based, right? That is can be any type of template, whether it be, you know, like, oh, I would like a Docker instance just to magically spawn up when 100 users are on the one instance, let's start a new one versus, you know, entire resource groups with different pieces of hardware just coming alive and scaling with it or uh, coming down. But this may also be like, I would like to say you're a, a software company that's having a service that's going to be multiple companies, they're isolated, so you could make a template and have multiple uh, pro products, the same product, but multiple for multiple customers. I'm, I'm, I forget what they're called. Um, it's one of those, uh, like, like think of, of like um, a, a private GitHub, right? You've got the public GitHub and the private GitHub. It's the same thing, but they are two instances. So you, you can have that. You can have an entire, an entire system as a template and spin up a GitHub enterprise and a, obviously the GitHub public, right? So that, that is just, you design the template once and you've got your entire application, all the resources, we're talking, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of different connections and, and important pieces of data that are configurable and it can be um, maybe deployed with the click of a button. So so that's really great. And, and that's like the superpower of cloud, right? It's not like, okay, you're gonna make a copy of the hardware, install all the services, image those and then deploy physical hardware to the next customer site. It's it's a click of a button to get, maybe not a click, but a couple of clicks, and you have an entire application. And this and with that, it's also like that the health, a monitoring the, the health of an application. You can see all the bits and say, okay, are there errors? 
you know, alerts and, and any metrics you want, whether it be health, you know, performance, or even security. You can get in security notifications, and this is also just super easy to set up, and it's super available with dashboards and things like that. So, yeah, it's it's hard work to do it on premise, and super easy to do on the cloud. So that is really one of the benefits. Is there's no more responsibility for you to worry about certain things. Yeah, no, that is true. That is true. And there's there's many ways to perform management when it comes to your um, resources that are on the um, cloud. Uh, one of the more popular ways is just to use the actual portal. So uh, Matthew has said multiple times that a lot of these things that we're talking about is a simple drop down list or uh, or a um, numeric value or a slider. And it's easy to find these, these options inside of the portal itself and manage your, um, your uh, resources there. Then the next part is the, uh, the um, CLI or command line interface. This can be either through the Azure Dev CLI or the Power Platform CLI as I use pre pretty often you are able to interact with your um, resources, create, take out, scale up, scale out through the CLI. You don't have to be inside of the portal at all. You can take, you can do all of that from your uh, desktop. And because it's connected to your Azure, uh, to your Azure, it will read those commands and do exactly as you, um, as you, um, uh, as you tell it. The other way is through APIs. And when we say APIs, we're really talking about REST APIs, where you are developing apps and um, services that use APIs that interact with the various resources that you have inside of um, Azure. And uh, just jumping off of that is PowerShell. I'm not too familiar with how PowerShell works, but I am assuming, or I am, from what I've seen, it's very similar to the um, C to the CLI or the command line interface, where you are able to interact with these resources, with these um, with these uh, these cloud types, with the way that you configure your apps through a text based command line interface. And what's what's funny with these. Um, with, with these options that we see on our screen, it really speaks to the experience level. Um, if you are just starting out with cloud-based services and you, you, you're not sure about the breadth of the services that are being offered to you, you might be comfortable using the web portal and just seeing things you know, in, its, in its physical sense and touching things and moving things. That's where you might feel most comfortable with. And then as you gain more experience, as you come accustomed to the services that Azure has, then you, you know, you progress to the command line interface. And then as your, ex ex as your experience level grows with that, you can then start creating, you know, REST APIs uh, using the various programming la uh, languages that are available to you. So it's really a thing of either what is your um, best way to interact with your um, resources, with your, with your um, config files and so on. Or if you're just starting out, you might just want to, you know, go into the web portal or maybe someone like uh, Matthew, who's actually quite senior, his favorite might be, you know, through the um, CLI. Speaking of which, Matthew, which one is your favorite? How do you manage your Azure resources usually? As a cloud expert, I still use the web portal. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't do enough cloud things to, yeah, I, I like sure. sliders. I can see the numbers changing, say, okay. Phew. Yeah, but no, no, same. It, it, you know, it, it's where, as you, as you mentioned, like maybe you, you have some sort of CI or something like that, right? You don't, you can't really do that. So having the API, so it, it's, yeah, it, it, I think it's the thing, it's like, oh, you know, which one is better? And I think the answer to that question is, which one do you like better? And which one works? Yeah, for better? sure. So, <laughs> there's too many yeah, options. Yeah, I, I'm also a big fan of the portal itself. But like recently, um, as I mentioned, I work a lot with the um, Power Platform and I like to extend parts of the Power Platform using um, .NET or um, JavaScript where 
I would go in into like VS Code and create a API that works with you know with Dataverse. Then I would deploy that to an Azure function using the um, Azure Dev CLI, and then I'll use the Power Platform CLI to deploy that to my Power Platform in in environments. Then if I want to monitor things and check the cost and see how everything is going, I would then switch to the web uh, portal to manage all of that. So it's really based, it's what you like or what serves you best in that given moment. So with that, we have time for one more knowledge check, actually two more. This is the second knowledge check that we have. Um, Lebo will be coming in uh, just to make us aware of some of the comments that are coming in from YouTube and all the other streaming platforms. But let's go ahead and get started with the first question. Which type of scaling involves adding or removing resources? So this is in terms of VMs or containers to meet a growing demand. So we have A, vertical scaling, B, horizontal scaling, as well as C, direct scaling. Lebo, you've been listening to us for a while now. <laughs> Do you want to have a crack? <laughs> uh so i actually want to give an opportunity to the to the participants because i For saw sure. as you were going through the knowledge check some of them would answer at exactly the same time as you'd give the answer so i wasn't sure if they got uh, it right or if yeah. it was a coincidence uh so uh davis prosper francis omoruto amen uh san i'm calling you all out uh to please take part in this knowledge check and yeah and if if they don't go at it i'll i'll answer and while we wait um you guys touched on a topic that i'm very very passionate about which is um availability scalability reliability and predictability so i look forward to like us taking a deep dive in that uh during future sessions you know because i know today um, we're focusing a lot on building that ASP.NET web app and deploying it to Azure. And with the, with the future uh, broadcasts, I really look forward to us showing people how to actually do that through Azure load testing, which is one of my favorite services. Oh, hey, uh, I see. Sure. So we've got uh, Davis Prosper. Uh, so... He says his answer is A, A, vertical A. scaling. What yeah. do you think, Matthew? I think, I think you, you actually said it quite well when you were describing it, right? Vertical and horizontal. Vertical, think of it as you're adding more to the one instance, right? You have some sort of machine and you're adding more RAM. And horizontal was like, well, I'm going to add a new machine. So I don't know that yeah. gives a hint. I don't know what direct scaling is. Uh, I try to do something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what direct scaling is. Uh, it's maybe it's just a, a thing to uh, throw us off. But um, I think the answer here is B, because like you um, said, when we we're adding more VMs, we we're adding more instances or more uh, more uh, resources to be able to keep up to the growing demand. So the answer here is definitely B. But yeah, no, if you answered A, you weren't far off. Um, it's not a train smash at all. Uh, Matt, do you want to take this one? Yes. Um, uh, I suppose we can just read the thing. What is characterized yeah. as the ability of a system to recover from failures and continue to function? And uh, now we just spoke about that. There's the three, there's reliability predictability and scalability. So which one is the option for recovering from failures? Let's, uh, let's see. What are the yeah, people let's saying? Let's give them a few seconds. Uh, yeah, let us know. Not sure how much the latency think. is between us speaking and uh, reaching the interwebs. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, Matthew, just a quick like recap on each one of those. Um, answers that we have there okay i'll start from the bottom 
Um, scalability is um, wondering if that comment is for the first question. Anyway, the scalability is basically the uh, characteristics of being able to add more more power to your app, whether it be a whole new VM or adding more RAM. Predictability is to to be able because you're running on the cloud and everything is being tracked and you can actually monitor in real time what's happening. You can take those data and uh, see what's going to happen tomorrow or next year, and also based on stuff. So that's predictability to see the future or mm -hmm. you know, predict the future. And reliability is the ability for um, as people are mentioning lots in the chat there of. Uh, you know, being reliable, being like, oh, if something goes wrong, how quick is it to, to get back up, you know? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and I think that pretty much gives it away uh, with the answer being A. We have a few people who answered A, so that is great. Um, it I'm sure that we we aren't too boring. Or people are actually listening, so it's just cool. <laughs> Um, with that, let's swiftly move along to the next section. Here we will be discussing the different types of cloud services. So we touched a bit on this um, earlier on, but now we're really going to go into depth about these three main cloud service types. And we'll also identify the appropriate use cases for each of those three. So we have IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. You say them how, uh, however you you wish. They are quite long, so I like to keep them short. So with the first one, infrastructure as a service or IaaS is a sort of like you're renting the infrastructure needed to deploy your um, your service, your app, or what have you. And it is the most flexible category of all of these cloud service types. But it's also the one, as we mentioned earlier, the one where most of the responsibility falls on you, the customer. So you have to do a lot of that middle work of configuring everything, making sure that everything, um, that everything lines up before you actually go ahead and deploy your ARM service. So under this, this particular uh, model, the cloud provider is the one that bears the, the um, responsibility of maintaining the hardware, the uh, physical security, and the network to connect you to the internet or to the millions of customers you may have worldwide. But on the other hand, you are the one who will be most accountable for everything else. This includes in installing your operating system. Um, like I said, all the uh, middleware of the config files and making sure that everything lines up, as well as maintenance, the network setup, and all those other small things that you would need to do on your end to make sure that this service model works best for you. Especially when it comes to infrastructure as a service, you know, you, it's important to note that you're essentially just renting the hardware in a cloud data center. And it's up to you to really decide exactly how you're going to be using it. Uh, uh, Matthew, you yeah. want to just uh, discuss like how that really um, shares within the responsibility model? Yeah. Um... I was just checking to see if someone's mentioning that the, none of the chats are being seen. I'm not sure. Uh, OK. Let Lebo will have a look at that, investigate it, our detective. Um, yeah, so talking about the shared extent, uh, responsibility model, I, I sort of mentioned this a bit before, so I won't go too much, is, and you were talking about the um, infrastructure as a service and where the cloud provider just takes responsibility effectively for the the hardware and the connection of that hardware to the internet, right? And that's where they take their hands off and say, you know what, you have now a machine that's running and it's on the internet. It's up to you from now on. So that's sort of the, the infrastructure, right? The, the physical hardware infrastructure that they're providing to you as their service. Yeah. And then, 
I suppose you can you can move sure. on to some examples. Yeah, one of the common use cases when it comes to this specific service type is called the lift and shift migration. I actually just learned about this a couple of weeks back. Well, but it's where you are you have your data, your app, your service on prem and you want to stand up cloud resources um, so that you can move your your um, resources from your on prem data center data store onto the uh, cloud model and this sometimes serves as a introduction for companies into cloud computing as a whole where for the longest of times you've been running everything on on your own but now you want to just set up a quick vpn with all of the same you know config as your original data center and then from there you are able to lift your your um, infrastructure as it is and just put it into the the um, cloud so this is a typical uh, like the typical use case why someone would would use this type of um, service model. And what's great about this is that it's also great for testing and development. Maybe you want to have the production um, parts of your app on your data store and you want the testing parts or any other deployment slots on a public cloud where you are running essentially the same service, but elsewhere. And um, if you have a set of config files that work on your on-prem data data store, like I said, all it takes is for you to simply spin up a VM with the exact same config as you have, and you'll be able to move that to another place. So that is the main or one of the main use cases that people would use infrastructure as a service. Let's talk about paths or platform as a service. Yeah, oh, um, I can do this one, and 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 I suppose you know as we move in towards less uh, less less things you have to do. Platform as a service is the sort of the middle one in that right. If infrastructure service, you get a hardware to work on. This one is like okay, we'll, the provider will give you a little bit more things, and this would be for example, you know, physical infrastructure, security, as you mentioned, the connection, internet, but also the operating system, the middleware where the dev tools, the business intelligence services, you know, and, and I suppose licensing and patching rights, all that, like, it's basically not just giving you a place to host your VM. It's like, well, we'll give you the VMs for it, right? We'll give you the, uh, the bits that you can take your app and you say, okay, I would like to host my website on your technology. Um, so you can go ahead, make your website in your local machine, commit it and push it to the cloud. And that's where you take responsibility, just your code that's running. And if you need certain additional things, for example, authentication or something, or user management, you can maybe have, like for example, the Active Directory, right? Or, or Active Directory BTC is, you're not worried about anything. You just want something that manages users, right? That's the platform, right? Active Directory platform or the app services. And you can have those things configured. You didn't set it up. You didn't write any code for getting it there. But now you can put your code on top, right? You hook up your, your, your let's say, your ASP donated website. You stick it on the web service. And, of course, your um, your users can be connected to, to there as well. So, yeah. And you don't have to worry about maintaining anything. And, and that will be great so that your, co your company can focus on what's important rather than you know oh the users need to lock in where's two-factor authentication uh okay now let's talk about mobile providers and stuff like that, as you can take care of two-factor authentication with a checker box yeah yeah and as we speak about these uh, different um uh, cloud service types we're gonna revisit this um diagram because it really shows us exactly how the different service types plays on the on the type of responsibility that we have as a customer as opposed to what the cloud provider has. So in this case, PaaS or um, plat platform as a um, service really splits that, um, that uh, layer between you and the cloud provider. 
in this case, Azure or whatever cloud that you use is responsible for, main, for maintaining the physical infrastructure and its access to the internet. Just like in infrastructure as a ARM service, in the past model, the cloud provider will also maintain the OS, the um, databases, and the development tools. So as, um, as uh, Matthew mentioned, you just have to put out your, your code and the cloud will take care of the um, rest. So think of platform as a service as it's like using a domain joined machine, right? So IT maintains the device with regular updates, patches, and all of that. You just have to make sure that your code is working and it's deployed to the relevant resources. And, and some scenarios are, I suppose we have already mentioned them, like you hosting a website or, or, or things like that, right? It's the, everything's there, just your code is now running on the technology. You know, and, and an example in here would be example to an Excel macro. I haven't used Excel macros, but, um, you know, you can write a bit of code to Excel is the platform and the macro is is your application in the, in the, in the cloud. So that that is uh, one of the benefits. And, and I suppose because you no longer have to manage the actual, oh, how much RAM does this thing have? You know, you can say, well, I don't care. I want more of it. So, and that's, that's where sliders become, right? You can't really have sliders as much for infrastructure because it's a VM that you are running and you choose what the VM is. Whereas this one is like Microsoft decides, okay, I'm going to give you something and some options. So you drag that slider and it will configure the infrastructure for you. And that's where the, the, the platform becomes more exciting. I was like, well, I've got more sliders, more knobs to turn and less responsibility on what happens when I do that. So yeah, that's that that's one of the benefits of going towards a platform as a service as opposed to a lift and shift. But I do my website, I put it on there, and I'm responsible for my website and I drag sliders as opposed to lift and shift. Someone has to maintain a VM, someone has to do things. And another benefit of having all the stuff running that's pre-configured, you don't have to set up your analytics and your business intelligence, right? You have a website that's set to do logging and whatever uh, information you need to put out the events. The, info, the, the platform can listen for those events and put it somewhere and do something and respond. Whereas you've got a VM, um, you know, well, you own the VM, right? So you do it. And, and this is where moving towards platform and service again as a benefit is that it has all that data and especially with history and, and, and stuff, you get those events and you can actually take what's happening, respond or make predictions. So yeah, it's very exciting yeah. doing less work. <laughs> and then the last main um, service type is software as a um, service. This is maybe one that we're all quite familiar with, and we probably use tools that have this type of um, service. How, however, we don't really realize that it's using uh, software as a um, service. In this case, it is the most complete um, cloud service model from a product perspective. Again, I'm gonna take it back to what I said earlier, when we think of the suite of tools that um, Microsoft 365 offers. So everything is already hosted in the um, cloud and that's how it's serviced to you. We may not know where it is. Some of us you know, might not even care as long as we can use that um, service every month. And as long as we keep paying a monthly fee, then we can continue to use those um, services. So with, with, with um, software as a um, service, you're essentially renting or using a fully developed app for yourself. This type is the easiest to get set up because all you have to do in most cases is either log into an online portal or download the um, specific app, and then you will just have to log in, make sure that your payments are up to um, date. You don't have to deal with any mid-level uh, config files or options or sliders and you know numbers. That's all you need to do to access this type of software. 
Yeah, and again, we've got the chart and you can have a look and we're basically moving all the way to his left, all the way to the top. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's nothing you do, right? The accounts that's created by users. So we've gone from someone has to, you know, uh, from on-premise, I have to buy my hardware, I have to run my VM, I have to write my application and maintain my user accounts all the way down to, well, Nothing's, in, nothing's, I have to do nothing. All I need to do is, you know, manage my users. Like in the Microsoft 365 example, the user documents, the, you know, what does your application, uh, well, not even what does your application do? It's just, yeah, you, know, like you, you do such a little as a provider, but you still can um, take advantage of all the stuff with the cloud, the scalability, all the stuff that's underneath, you still get, <laughs> but you don't have to um, worry about it. Identity, applications, the operating system, and nobody cares about hardware anymore. And it's just, uh, it's just a slider. So yeah, very, very cool. Yep. And when it comes to the common use cases that come with this, like I said, most of us are probably using these this type of um, service model without us even knowing. You know your your email and messaging apps, which are provided by services like M365, or your business productivity apps like a to do app, or even the Power Platform. You know any type of app that is readily made and it's available to you. Like Matthew said, all you have to do is create your own account, log in, and you can get started um, uh, using it right away. Uh, a very clear cut way of understanding or figuring out that you are possibly using a software as a service app is an app where you are paying a standard monthly fee to use that app. That's most of the time a giveaway that it is a software as a service. And with that, we have our final knowledge check. Um, let's uh, get some in engagements going in chats as we just answer some of the final questions that we have before we get to a quick demo. I'll go ahead and take the first question. Let me just read it. Uh, which cloud service type is most suited to a lift and shift migration? from an on-premises data center to a cloud deployment. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> this is uh, this has been mentioned quite a bit. I think we're not going to waste too much time with this, but we'll see if some comments come in. Just uh, remember, you know, starting from the bottom, software as a, as a um, service is a already deployed, fully made app that you just access via the web and pay for every month. Your know, platform as a um, service is making sure that your code works and your systems work before you deploy it to Azure and Azure will handle that for you. And then the infrastructure as a um, service is where you just get the actual infrastructure and you have to go ahead and configure certain elements. Um, which also serves as an entry point for most people who want to migrate from on-premises to the cloud. So I think I have already mentioned the exact answer. Matthew, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, infrastructure. We yeah. love infrastructure. <laughs> and, and I suppose the, the, the question there is that lift and shift, right? You're coming from an on-premise server, so you want a on-cloud server. You don't want you don't want to like yeah. rewrite the application sure. to make it fit sure. in whatever it needs to be. And then I, I can uh, do the next question quickly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I see. Yeah. I suppose we we probably got a bit of lag, and I see. Uh, yeah. Do you not see it? Okay, let me let me. I'm going. No, no, no I, I mean the, the chat. Um, we should need oh, to okay. more time. But I think I think we've done a lot, and we've got some demos we want to get to. So let's let's go yeah. through this relatively quickly. Uh, what type of cloud service would you? Ex uh, what type of cloud service type would a finance and expense tracking application be in? And I think it start from the top down and stuff. Infrastructure as a service. This would be like someone's providing you with hard drives and RAM. 
uh, SOC platform as a service, someone's providing you effectively with a VM, right? Uh, um, a, a powerful VM that you run your app on. And obviously software as a service, this is like, you know, uh, the word application, or as you mentioned, um, anything that has a standard monthly fee would be that. And yeah, uh, yeah I'm seeing C's in the chat. So let's see, is C the correct That's answer? Great. This I think it is. Yes, we will. Great, great, great. Do we have one more? Actually, no, yeah. we don't. Time for a quick Q and A. Uh, if there's any questions in chat or anything you'd like to ask us regarding the content that we've just been speaking about for the past nearly ninety minutes, and then we'll move on to a quick demo. Yeah, so the question that did come through was early on before um, you started the presentation. And I think you will be answering it in your demo because your demo involves um, you opening up Visual Studio, connecting to Azure as you build your web app. So one person said that they are struggling to connect to Azure through Visual Studio 2022. And at the moment they can only connect using VS Code. So perhaps you can just show them from inside of Visual Studio 2022 how to connect or possibly raise a ticket from inside of Visual Studio 2022. Sure. Sounds good. Well, what do you think, Matthew? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I see. <laughs> Any other used, questions? Uh... Uh, the other None question the was answered. Um, it wasn't based okay. on the content. It was just regarding the recording. Um, so Amen was asking if the session is being recorded. And the answer yeah. is yes. And it will remain available on YouTube for you to access uh, after the live stream. Yeah, it will. Uh, possibly like after an hour or so, you will see it in the live tab of the .NET channel, um, it will be available to you. Shall we move on to our demo? Yes, let's, let's write some code. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so uh, I know I'm equally excited. Uh, sorry to just uh, interrupt. There was one question around support from Gabi Pokoto. Um, he didn't mention the type of support that he's inquiring about. But I would just wanted to give visibility to everyone that from inside of the Azure portal, you are able to get help and any ticket that you raise will be attended to. So that's what they mean by support. You know, if you raise a ticket, someone will pick it up, get in touch with you and help troubleshoot it. Sure. Sounds good. Let's uh, let, let's let's just use the the tail end of the session to just quickly show you the .NET parts. Um, I'll just quickly switch my screen. If we can just do that quickly. Um, to Visual Studio. And I'm hearing chickens in the meantime. <laughs> Yeah, no, those are the chickens talking in my in my backyard. <laughs> nice. Um, let's go. So, if we're, with my screen being back, um, what what we'll be doing is a very simple process. We'll be creating a .NET Core web app, and then we're going to be publishing that web app to Azure, just to have that intersection of .NETs with the stuff that we've been talking about. And if we have a bit more time, we will discuss some of those tools that you have in Azure as well, specifically highlighting the Azure app service where the .NET app will be deployed to. So I don't know, Matthew, should I just start and then um, I'll hand it over to you. Um, no, we can. I suppose we can cool. we can go ahead and create the project, talk about what we see, and then yeah, you know, let's sure. publish it to the to the to the cloud and see what happens. And then yeah, yeah. Just before I we create, to... I just wanted 
Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, just before we we um, create, there is um, certain workloads that you need to be able to build .NET apps inside of Visual Studio, as well as to connect it to Azure. So in the past, when you download Visual Studio, it would just come with a bunch of workloads. It would be this very heavy, heavy, heavy app. Now, I don't know which version introduced the workload thing. You can choose the specific um, bundles that you need to develop your apps. So I have an instance of Visual Studio 2022. Let me go to modify just to let you know what those workloads look like. We have the ASP.NET and Web Dev workload. So it's basically a bundle which allows us to create, as it's saying, ASP.NET, core, HTML, JavaScript, and containers using Docker, and a bunch of other tools that are specific to that development type. And then in the same breath, we are, we are going to show you how to deploy to Azure. We need to be able to access our Azure resources and write to Azure. And for that, we need the Azure development workload, which is a bundle of tools that, uh, that allows us to interact with, um, with Azure pretty much. And of course we have uh, individual components that you can deploy to your Visual Studio as well. Um, you see, we have a bunch of .NET stuff here. Right now, I think the latest I have is .NET 7, um, but the latest um, version of .NET, which is actually in private, uh, preview is, or oh, public preview, sorry, is .NET 8. Um, you can install that um, SDK if you want to use the latest features. Um, I just have that long-term, so that, that LTS version of .NET. Uh, so with those workloads installed, as you can see, I already have them installed. Uh, let's go ahead and open up Visual Studio. I already have it opened up. And the process is simple, creating a new project. It's just create new project, and then you can choose the templates that you have. So we're gonna go for a ASP.NET Core web app. So I'll just uh, double click into, to, into that. Then we, we can go ahead and choose a project name. Matthew, do you have any ideas for a name that we can use? <sighs> What, what is what is distinctly African? Uh, let's do this. <laughs> lion riders, right? Everybody knows in Africa, we all ride to school in the shops on the back of lions. So let's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like let's Uber, see. but you can, I don't know, hold out a piece of meat and the lion will come to you. And you can... Yeah, yeah, no, let's add more on fire to that rumor. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Live here, we're going to develop there. Sure. So yeah, we have the project name, we have the, where the projects will be based and then let's click on next. And then the next set of options is choosing what framework you'll be using the auth type. In this case, we're not going to do anything related to auth. We want everyone to be able to access our app. Um, any other uh, features you want to highlight, Matthew? I suppose um, the Docker that that will um, is is yeah. a, a quite cool. It allows you to like right now you're taking your app, you're going to compile it and get a bunch of files, and then you have to sure. basically copy it onto a server or upload it to a service. And you have the the option of what Microsoft provides. Like you've got ten, like maybe a couple of Ubuntu, a couple of you know, Alpine Linux is probably your windows and a, something sure. but if you for whatever reason you need a specific one you can use docker containers and basically say i would like this version of this os in this particular configuration with this set of prerequisites and things installed so even in uh, the platform as a service model Katia, you, you get you get some cool things so yeah docker is definitely something to check out we obviously can't talk about it right now but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that so, needs a whole different session. Yeah. So let's go ahead and create that. Um, that should take a couple of seconds to provision the full .NET, um, the .NET Core web project for us. You know, the, that didn't take too long. And this is what you have as soon as you create a project. 
Now, like with any other project, we have a certain project structure that we stick to. So um, in this case, we created a .NET Core um, Razor project. There's, there's other frameworks or other methods you can use like the MVC model. But this sort of um, this sort of structure really is beneficial for those starting out with .NET. Um, any specific folders sections you want to highlight, Matthew? Um, well, for those who've done .NET development, I mean uh, you understand the C sharp files, and uh, if done web development, we've got the pages model. This is uh, following more from the Razor pages. Um, yeah. But for those who haven't done much.net, it's this is the, the solution explorer basically shows all the bits in your project. So you've got connected services in there, whatever that may be, uh, dependencies or anything that you're pulling in, for example, oh, you want to add some sort of authentication from Nougat, which is the package manager, or you want to do some JSON parsing and you want to use a custom library, or if you're doing like database access, you know, obviously you would maybe install some database package entity framework, which will talk to databases for you. So you pull in other dependencies. It's not like you write everything yourself, as with all, all uh, application kits. And then I suppose the important one is the WW root. This is where you put your CSS, your JS, uh, JavaScript, and any dependencies that are JavaScript. Right? This is stuff that's going to get you the, to the client. And of course, you can put static HTML pages in there. For example, if you have certain pages in your app that's just plain HTML and you don't want to worry about writing code for it. So even though it's an ASP.NET application with .NET in the name, it also has all the normal web stuff that you would have. You know, as you can see, Bootstrap and, and jQuery right there, and along with some JSON uh, JavaScript files. And then, of course, in the pages folder is sort of the .NET side of all of that, right? So you would have a some JavaScript that does some stuff, and I also have some C Sharp. And, uh, and in this case, this is a special format of a hybrid, you know, HTML, C Sharp, you know, thing. And it's the CS HTML, which is a very a cool. Developers took two things, stuck them together, and used that as the name. And this is, if you look over there, um, <clears throat> not only is it plain C Sharp, as is this current page, right? This is a model that contains uh, features for the page for example in this case the guy wants to hook up a logger and there's some sort of get method but if you go back to the cshtml you can sort of semi-recognize oh wait that's a div that's html right and then of course you've got these little at things um there's no other pages here maybe just go to the error page i just want to show off the, the inline stuff uh like that, right? So this one has plain HTML header one with some text class danger, right? This is uh, bootstrap doing some stuff, but then in line, this is at if, and then the at model dot request ID. This is where the, mm -hmm. the, the awesomeness of the razor syntax comes in. You have HTML, you have C sharp, but you can now mix them together. So you put that at sign and then whatever follows, obviously within certain rules, will be like in the case of the if statement, it's whatever's between the two parentheses. Um, but in the case of the one line code there, right, you have C sharp inline HTML. And when that value changes, it will refresh the page or whatever part of the page is. So uh, there's way too much to go in to talk about how Razor works. But if you're new to development or you've been doing, you know, normal JavaScript or hopefully TypeScript, um, using this is also really really cool it's uh it's not like oh typescript it's not a replay uh like you know instead of javascript or in a different way but this is a way to mix two technologies in one and, and there's a whole different set of benefits so it's not doing away with javascript and and let's say pwas but this is also a different way to do development if you are dot net friendly so yeah it's pretty sure. cool yeah, no, that, uh, that's true. I just love that two file system that it has where you have that um, that uh, Razor file, that CSHTML file, where it has, you know, um, H HTML and C sharp code. And then you have the code behind file where you can uh, access, you know, requests and services before sending it over to your to your view. In this instance, your, your um, view. So with that, when you create an app, you already have a working app. And I can prove that just by quickly running it. 
and we'll see that it will run an app that that um, that will come in. So I'm just waiting for that app to pop up. Once it once it's on our screen, let me see where did it go. Am I not seeing it? Oh, it's 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 still running. There you go. There is our Lion Rider screen, right? Lion Riders app. So just two pages that you have there, home and a um, uh, privacy page, but it is something to get you started with. So then let's actually clo close this and go back to the code. And this is where we might want to deploy the app to Azure. Let's just say we've just built a really awesome site and um, and it's, it is um, beautiful. It's using all these various services. Now we want people to actually use it. So we can do something which is can get a bit controversial. Um, some people call this click ops uh, before you actually set up actual DevOps, but the right click publish, you know, again, if you are just starting out, this is a great way for you to quickly get your app right into the Azure portal. You just right click on the project name and there's a publish button right there. So as you publish, it will be creating a, a um, publish file where it will have all the config to be able to pass our code to Azure. So in, in this case, we want to use Azure. And then we're going to be publishing to an Azure app service. Um, in this case, we want to use the Windows version of an Azure app service. Maybe Matthew just quickly highlights exactly what an Azure app service is. You know, this is what we've been talking about a lot in the middle, the, the platform as a service, right? So we're going to build our app and the publish step is going to create a package that's going to copy that and run it just, just your DLLs and your files on Azure. No need for configuration. Obviously, you can configure your app service, whatever you yeah. want to do. But that app service, Azure provides a service that allows you to run your app. So, no, not for infrastructure. And obviously, it's not a um, uh, software as a service, right? You are the software as a service. So, yeah. And the ones above it, the container apps, right? These were the, the Docker containers that I, I mentioned earlier. This is basically not just your app. You can bring in whatever requirements and dependencies you need, like additional software that you need. And then of course, virtual machine, this is the, the holy grail of full control. You configure everything. So, and yeah. also you can see in the app service, it's got Windows and Linux, right? So you not only get to choose options, but you get to choose sub options. So yeah. For sure. I mean, yeah. Do you want to do so Linux? Let's go. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> hey, but Microsoft loves loves of Linux. Don't 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 have, get me wrong. Um. So yeah. So we'll we'll choose that as our target, the Azure App Service. You'll note that I'm already logged in with my uh, work email there. The way to log in is you can just let me actually just go out of this. If you just log into your Azure um, to your Visual Studio. It will use the same email to log in to log you into Azure. If it needs additional auth for you to maybe put in your um, your Azure uh, password, as soon as you log into Visual Studio, it'll ask you, "Do you also want to log into Azure?" And it's just available by clicking on. If if you're not logged in, you'll see like an empty user little guy profile thing. Just click on that, sign in. And it gives you the option to sign into both Azure and Visual Studio. So again, let me go ahead and click on add a publish profile. That's the same thing as right clicking and clicking on uh, publish. So Azure, Azure app service, as you can see, I'm logged in and then you have a subscription name. So subscriptions are basically the things that the services that you are paid for this this there's uh different types of um, subscriptions that you can have um each type has a different support level i see that there's a bit of a of a conversation happening in the in the chats when it comes to support and um so on there's different uh resources that you get with the different descriptions that you that you have so this is the one that i'll be using for today 
And then we need to create an app service. We chose Azure App Service as a target, but we still need to create an instance of a app service. In this case, there is no instance. So usually our instances will show up here. Let's quickly create a new instance. And for the sake of time, I think we will just use all the default values. Let me go ahead and choose a new so South African group. region there, uh, the, the region, right? Or is, is your resource group? Yeah, I suppose you'll see it now, yeah. 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 So let's go ahead and create a resource group, um, a new uh, resource group. A resource group is just uh, essentially a folder that allows you to group together related resources. So if you have an Azure app, service, you have a um, SQL server database, you have an Azure function, or all, all of these services that relating that relate to one thing, you can store them in a resource group, which is essentially a folder. So we'll just okay. call or call it the the lion group. Um, one one benefit that that having uh, or using a resource group is that they semi isolated. So you could have you don't want to have your database in one resource group. You know, I don't know East US, and then you have your website in I don't know Europe. That means every time the website wants to talk to the database, it has to go out, cross the wire, and then back. Whereas if it's in the same resource group in the same data center area then you know uh, the performance and latency is, is much better so it's sure. something you can sure. obviously do things and move things but yeah so resource yeah. groups yeah and then we have a um, hosting plan there is a uh, default hosting plan yeah, but we can create a new one if we if we want i think matthew this is what you were alluding to uh, earlier on where you can choose the location of that specific hosting plan you know, maybe if for for now, because we are creating the the actual app and we're still in the development phase, it would be nice to have the location be closer to home since we are based here. But then may, maybe our customers are based in the US. So maybe when we deploy the actual app to production, you would then change that specific hosting plan. Yeah. Um, and then what about size, Matthew? What what I mean, what? Uh... What is the one at the bottom? The credit card? You got the double thick one, right? When you know, these two bank accounts <laughs> have to be merged. Sure, sure, I'm sure, not sure, sure. What model yes. are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So this is just um, so you. There's uh, different sizes when it comes to the um, hosting plan. This can depend on a number of different things, not just the size of your app, but the size of all the dependencies that you have and and um, and all of that. If you understand um, what size it is that you need, you are able to configure that here. But if you're just starting out, you can just uh, go ahead with the um, default size there. So I'm not gonna create a new one. I'll just use the default. Let's go ahead and create that. That will then create a app service for us. And while that's loading, um, that might take a couple of seconds. Let me just uh, quickly hop into the Azure portal. So this is the Azure portal that we're in now. And again, I'm in the resources group. So just like how we created a resource group inside of Visual Studio, how we're currently creating an app service inside of Visual Studio, you are able to do the exact same thing inside of your portal. So you, you can then uh, go ahead, click create, create a new resource group. I don't know why, okay, there you go. Create a new resource group. Once that resource group is created, you can then go ahead and say, maybe I want to create, um, uh, let me just do this. I want to create a app service, right? So I create a app service inside of the portal once that portal is, uh, once that app service is created, I then publish the, I, I download the publish profile and I can connect that to my app. So sort of like a round about way people might prefer that than using the built-in tools inside of Visual Studio. So there you go, our app service is created. We click on finish and then it's going to, 
create a profile. So people might assume that this is the publishing phase, but really what it's doing, it's creating that published profile that you can also download from the Azure portal. And once that profile is created, then there's a big old publish button that you can just click. And then that will then start the process of validating the config inside of the published profile and then sending it into Azure. Did that create the resources yet or only after you click the publish button? So this published profile, did that actually spin up resources on so, Azure's portal side? Oh, and we have an error. We have a build error. I wonder web deployment task failed. What a shame. Let me just fix this. But to answer your um, question, it has already created uh, created the the resource group and the Azure app um, service. Then it gets the um, details of those resources and puts them into the publish profile. Then the publish profile is now connected to my uh, .NET Core app. Once I click publish, it reads all those config um, uh, attributes inside the published profile and sends them to those resources that have been already created inside of Azure. So I'm going to try and publish it once again and see what so happens. Something about your login not valid, which is oh, weird. Oh, my because... login is not valid. I am logged in. And you, you just created the resources. Uh, yeah. I just, let's see. Publish. See my computer. Mm, that's interesting. Maybe there's an issue in the resource groups because you is it, where is the resource group region? Um, I wonder if it was, I asked you to it change was, it that do bad it was things. East US. Yeah, that's I'm, possibly I'm live the demo. debug. Yeah, yeah, we. The sacrifice to the demo gods didn't work out. <laughs> do it. Do another published profile, and try. Um, well, it's East US, right? That's the app service. East US, yeah. yeah. So you so did the yeah. default. You didn't actually change it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So this just shows, like you said, the actual web service, the app uh, service, is live, is created. Now we're trying to push our code to that app service. And for some reason that I'm not sure. Because there are no passwords is, in, in use here, yeah, right? Yeah, there's no passwords. Unauthorized. Do you perhaps have a... Uh... Hmm, let the... me see. Maybe if we have another... Let me see if I have a a resource that I can show that's already published. And then we can just demo that. This is what ha happens when you live demo. I suppose you while you load that up, the... are there any questions? Sure. Oh, Wayne yeah. says sign in, sign in again. So one of you yeah. just log out, log in. Sign in and again. Turn it off and turn it on again. Okay, let me sign in on the site just so. And if you publish now, does it pop up a sign in dialog? Like just sign in to Azure, or do you also need to use the VS sign in? Let me. Yeah. Pu publish credentials, yeah. Let me just sign in quickly. Very interesting. Very. Maybe it's some sort of, um, what do they call it? Uh, keys. Yeah, interesting. All right. There we go, folks. Any questions in the chats while I try and tackle this issue? Yeah. So not a question, but just a comment from Babaka. Um, he was wondering why are you not using the Azure CLI for the deployment? <laughs> that is a option <laughs> for sure. Um, just that for the scope of this particular session, uh, we wanted to show this uh, method 
However, we will be having, well, not necessarily me, but this channel will be hosting other other um, .NET sessions that show exactly how to use the CLI, the web portal, and that kind of thing. If we did have more time, we definitely would be using other methods as well. One thing that um, that you reason you would use a CLI would be like if you're doing CI-based things, right? So you're going to push this code to GitHub, you're going to trigger some sort of pipeline, and that obviously doesn't have right-click deploy, so you'll be forced to use the CLI, and that would be build, run, you get an artifact, and then you would run some CLI commands to get that onto the cloud. Um, in fact, right. you probably won't be using the CLI. You would be using one of the, the build um, actions. If you, let's say you can get up actions, that there's a build actions would be like as you deploy, you enter a couple of properties and boom, so technically deployed with YAML, uh, if you want to you want to take it like that. But yeah, that uses the CLI under the hood because yeah, and you know, that right click publish is pretty cool because it does the build and deploy. Um, but clearly, right now, <laughs> it's not doing that. Yeah, um, it's not doing that. So I am uh, logging in elsewhere. So we'll have that going. Um, any other questions so in the meantime? There's a little bit of a comment from Gabi. Okay. Um, he's asking if the application itself is it running from inside of the agile portal well not I yet that, because yeah. we haven't published yet um but the uh, mm. resources are ready and waiting for us to push our code so it, it's the app is running yeah. locally um but once we figure out this pu publish issue then the actual app will be running from azure but right now it is not yeah. Um, okay. So, Homo, I think while you yeah. while yeah. you um, show us one that you deployed a while ago, um, mm -hmm. there's a question uh, which I can take on with with Matt around DevOps. It was asked earlier on by by Davis. Um, he asked if Oh, he asked me which programming language is best for DevOps. So even though DevOps wasn't in the scope of the stream, I wanted to just clarify that um, DevOps itself is a practice, a methodology. So it's not, it's not something that's tied to a specific programming language. So think of it as making sure that your software engineers and the people who are doing operations or your product managers are on the same page all the time with regards to your end-to-end -end software development life cycle. So that's the practice in which you use DevOps, um, you know, to make sure everybody's always on the same page. So it you, you can use a lot of things in an aspect, but you, you can use project boards as well to make sure people know who's working on what and how far they are with a project. And um, I see you asked around programming languages. So you mentioned C Sharp and HTML. So normally, if you have a project like maybe a web app, uh, it's either you use C Sharp and XAML or HTML and JavaScript. And for the DevOps piece, you can have other stuff like uh, GitHub projects or, uh, or or boards or anything really, just to make sure people know what are you working on? Um, what are you struggling with? What are your blockers? How can they help you? I think the the simplest way I can explain it is, is that it's it's a it's it's scrum in practice, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. The DevOps is, is as you mentioned, I think is the, the key, is the it's not a thing you do, it's rather a, a practice that you follow. Um, so like, for example, let's take this example, right? Technically, we, we're doing DevOps here. We write publishing. That is the ops and the devving stuff. But what you should be doing for more things would be having, okay, let's set up a pipeline for building, a pipeline for releasing, 
uh, some sort of uh, mechanism to handle, you know, when the build finishes, we move to the publishing, are we talking staging? You know, it's, it's basically the operations to take the, the code that you're developing to the customer somehow. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's not rather not a, th a, a technology, but, a, but an idea or a, a practice. So, yeah. Cool. Um, and I'm just going to check if if maybe there was another question we may have missed. Oh, uh, there was a question by Wayne asking if we can span across multiple regions. Yes, yes. Uh, you would use that for like redundancy. So you can, uh, you wouldn't want to have one application spanning across multiple regions, as I mentioned, like the dead base in the US and the website in the UK. You may have to, it's possible, right? It's, it's all internet, um, but you typically would rather have replication. So you would have the application running in the US and then you would have a version of the application either as a backup or running in a parallel or something for your UK customers, right? They can still connect to that and maybe have a centralized system. No, you can even do crazier things like, you know, have replicated databases. So the answer to that question is, is can you have it? The answer is yes. And how can you have it? The answer is yes. Um, because it, it's all up to how much money you have, as well as what are you yeah. trying to do? Like Facebook, you wouldn't want to have Facebook as a running just in the US, you might want to have some replication. So, you know, people can log in and then they've got those models of eventually, um, uh, uh, I forget consistent versus stuff like that. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, and that's all the benefit of the cloud, right? You can't have that unless you go set up an office in the US, office in Europe to do that. Yeah. So the cloud basically makes that answer to the question. Yes. Yeah. So I guess this uh, sort of motivates, uh, like it bumps up the conversation around reliability and predictable availability as as a possible talk, topic for for our next session but uh, homo i am bringing you back on as he does have um the app that he previously deployed before we went on live just to showcase to you what you should expect when you deploy your web app to the cloud so over to you homo so on screen right now is Actually, the app that we just built, I just logged in with my personal Azure. So I, th I think my work Azure has some beef with me that I need to sort out after this. Um, but this is basically what happens when you publish directly from Visual Studio. We, uh, we accepted all those default values and that is essentially became the name of our websites running right now on Azure App Service. Uh, let me just show you what that looks like. I am logged in with my personal account, so it took some of the, the theming from that. So sorry about the dark mode, but you will see a successful published um, uh, alerts there. And then you are then able to go inside of, of Azure, which I'll do right now. I am in the web app as we speak. So you can go into the web app and see some of the um, config files that we wouldn't usually need to interact with, especially when we are using platform as, as a um, service type models like the Azure app service. So for example, I'm in the web app now. And if I go to the configuration tab, we'll see that it took a lot of these settings directly from Visual, from Visual Studio, directly from the type of web app that we built. So if we go to general settings, we see that it knows that it's a .NET stack. It knows the um, .NET version, the platform, and all these other things that we would otherwise need to configure ourselves if we were using a infrastructure as a um, service type um, uh, model, creating a VM and doing all sorts of, of um, things. So with that, I hope you can see the, the difference between the um, service models. If you are deploying directly from Visual Studio or you're using the um, CLI, for the most parts, you'll be deploying to a platform as a um, service where 
you don't need to configure all of these uh, settings. But then if you want to do it on your own, you'd probably have to create a VM where you would have complete control on the types of services that you have. Matthew, is there okay. any specific things you want to highlight? In well, we can have a look at the, even though obviously there's so much to cloud, but one of the topics we've yeah. been talking about a lot today is the scaling. And I think these are two options to scale up and scale out. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure what's behind there, maybe a few sliders or something. Um, let's have it. Let's, 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 let's have, have a look. A look. So this is the scale up. And if I'm understanding the way the words they use here, this is the vertical scaling. So this would be adding more RAM. And I'm, I'm assuming it's probably going to ask you, do you want to change your 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 instance type right currently got the one gigahertz yeah basically pick yeah. more power and uh, it's pretty much you check the box and hit hit go and that that's that that's yeah that's going to the shop buying a brand new server and popping yeah. it yeah <laughs> yeah and obviously and it's, it is nice because you can see pricing yeah yeah exactly yes. that's that's the also nice box because you know exactly what you're getting and what you are paying for Let's see if the scale, and then the scale out, out is the other one. And if you look at that, right, you can slide some sliders. I'm not sure if the particular uh, thing you've selected has that. Okay, not in the scale out method, uh, rules yeah. based and stuff, right? We don't really, at the instance there, right, drag that slider and give yourself. That would be a lot. <laughs> do that. But, uh, you don't need money. You don't need money. You need servers. So, <laughs> I mean, look at that. that. That's that's the thing, right? Now, this is just mm -hmm. one tiny aspect. Scalability. There's the networking, um, the identity backups, free backup for your app. You know, I'm sure you can set up um, something there. Custom domains, as you mentioned, you've got the weird location one. insights yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, to like see right the 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 types of insights that are coming into your app. You can monitor traffic and all of that. Deployment slots, there are various slots, prod, dev, testing, what have you. Yeah. There's so many different types of um, configuration settings that we can have to a specific resource that we have in Azure. And again, we have this control because of the type of service model that we um, chose. But then again, you don't even have to look at any of the stuff if you don't have any need for it. But I think the more apps you build, the bigger the apps are, I think it will be crucial to get familiar with the types of configuration settings that you do have access to. Yeah, yeah I, know. I mean, we, 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 it's impossible to talk about the top 10 features of cloud, you know, in, yeah. in one thing, because it, it's there, so yeah. many things. And uh, yeah, authentication, we have turned it off, but you could totally link that up with Azure B2C, so if people can log in, um, well, corporate accounts or we can log in with customers yeah. and all oh, uh, social accounts like Twitters. I mean, there is, <laughs> there's too many options. And, and I think that's the, the nice thing of the cloud. It's, you don't have to do the work. If you have a website that you want to do these things, like, okay, sure. I'm going to write the code or we can say, well, I'll bring in some packages. But it's like, this one is, is, it's another level. It's the whole thing is, is, is buttons and sliders and, 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 more than, obviously, not all buttons and sliders. You're still going to write the app, but yeah, the, the I think it's the, the thing is as we've been mentioning is is choices and flexibility that is will be impossible to get with a single or even multiple on-premise servers. Um, there's no ways you can compete with the flexibility of having you know anything. Obviously, if you want bespoke particular things, then obviously maybe on-premise is or infrastructure as a service is what you want, but for platform as a service, uh, like the question that Wayne asked that, right? What if the region goes down? Well, this is why you have multiple regions. Um, I'm not sure if you get it on this one, it might be the resource group level, but you can have a website that has a, a failover. One of the demos that did one of the builds was you can actually have it follow the sun, right? So you know most customers are accessing stuff in the day. So as the sun goes around the world, you have the uh, the main sort of the primary server follow the sun, and the rest are just backups. So um, I'm not sure exactly in the portal how to do that. The apps it might be different because obviously you pick the free tier and you do the right click deploy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. the entire if the entire region goes down. 
That is that is scary because um, most data centers like the US has multiple regions, but if an entire region goes down, that's, that's significant. That must have been like a, a natural disaster or, I don't know, solar flare. And, um, yeah. but you can so, have it over multiple regions as well. So. Yeah. And I think another thing we can remind people is availability zones, right? So Azure mm. is built for resiliency to make sure that you, you know, like the five nines, as Wayne uh, commented there, the uptime is 99.999% guaranteed, but for purposes of your app's availability and scalability. One option that I've seen implemented by a friend is by using containers, you know, so as your demand increases, you could scale across containers, or you could also load test your application just to know, you know, how much you need, um, you know, to always be available and, and build for that resiliency. So I think I will, take down all these questions so that we can have a dedicated session on load testing, on reliability, and perhaps another one that's focused on, on DevOps as a practice. And we could show two types of methodologies, you know, approaching it from an Azure DevOps route, as well as one using GitHub. Um, there was a question around free exam certifications. So, Microsoft at the moment is actually running a global cloud skills challenge as part of the upcoming build conference. Uh, I am going to just post the link so that you are able to visit the site. So they're running the challenge. They have eight uh, different challenges on offer. Um, I think the rule is one voucher per person. So even if you participate in all eight challenges, you are only eligible for one exam voucher. And you must uh, make sure that you write that exam by September 2023. So please do sign up for Microsoft Build. It's upcoming on the 23rd of, of May. Amazing um, sessions coming up as well as new product announcements. But if you want to get your hands on that free exam voucher, make sure you participate in one of the eligible cloud skills challenges. Um, to wrap up, I'm going to give Matt and Humalemo just 30 seconds to summarize um, our intro to cloud computing today, as well as uh, how we've deployed a web app, uh, a .NET web app to, to Azure. And maybe if there are any resources you might wanna share, please feel free. But from all of us at learning.net, it's good night from beautiful Africa. Yeah, I know. Thank you all for um, watching and staying on for the full time. Uh, we wouldn't, this wouldn't be the African broadcast if we didn't stick to African time, which made us 13 minutes late. <laughs> but uh, there are a bunch of, yeah. <laughs> There are a, a bunch of events resources, which um, I think Lebo will put up as soon as I'm, I'm done talking, which you can see all the uh, modules that this specific um, session was based on. So we just hope you, you learn .NET. I'm an avid fan of .NET, even though I'm in the Power Platform space, I started off with um, .NET and I really, really am uh, grateful for all of you for watching. No, oh, no. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's, it's it's almost impossible to cover all the topics, or even the basics, yeah. or even the, the you know the few tips. Um, yeah, and I, if you haven't tried Azure, definitely give it a go. There's many many free resources, as you saw. I don't know if you noticed in the app service. There's a free tier. Uh, it's not uh, you know that big so you can't run your company on it um, but definitely it's free to try and uh, you can get started and you know try some things and play around and definitely you can learn uh, I, I love playing around with stuff i'm a total.net fan uh, i don't know if i can handle moving to power platform because um, you know, i need to write .NET code uh, but yeah there, there's so many things to learn and um, also one of the things to take away is is um with with cloud you know cloud is the future cloud is now cloud is the future so 
if you're working on something, think about your, your customers and uh, how you can leverage the cloud and optimize the costs and manage your, your cloud instance so you can get the power of the cloud, but you know still be more affordable than an on-premise server or self-hosting. Uh, there's, there's many options, many things, and it's all exciting, at least for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Thank, thank you, Lebo, for helping us behind the um, scenes. Yeah. From us, we'll see you soon. I'll see you in the next Cheers. one. Cheerio. Thank you. And um, to everyone who may have missed the links, uh, the recording will be available uh, following this broadcast. So you can just simply rewind on YouTube and join us next time. Uh, please do share uh, the, the URL with, with your friends so that they can join us next time on learning.net. Good night.